Sounds All good. right, welcome back, everybody. This is Derek Kirby, joined again by Saad Youssef of The Athletic. Saad, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Just uh, enjoying still a little bit that 51-point win. I, I thought they would do better. I didn't expect necessarily that. And so I know a lot of Maverick fans are very uh, conflicted on what to think of the team. They're getting a little too high and a little too low, I think. Yeah, I think after the first two games, you know, there was there were comments out there about how, you know, this was this was going to be a terrible season and things like that. And I think, you know, part of that is, you know, look, it was the Los Angeles Lakers, the reigning champs with LeBron James. And I think, you know, part of the reason why some fans felt that way was because of the Phoenix Suns. But you have to understand with Chris Paul and everything, that is an up and coming team that's going to be a legit team in in the Western Conference. So it's not like the Mavs got blown out by, by, you know, any scrubs or anything, but then, you know, they turned around and did what they did to the Clippers. And that was of course impressive. And, uh, and so that was interesting because I think that the most damning stat to come out of that game was the fact that they could play the entire second half and, and not score a point and they would have still won the game. I thought that was pretty <laughs> crazy. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. And that's, that's definitely something that I've heard that a couple of times. And every time I'm always like, Oh, wow, that's true. Like, it just slips my mind, uh, I guess, when I was doing post game and all that. But yeah, that's, it's very, it's telling for sure. And I think there's definitely not just because it's the early season, but there's definitely some kinks to work out with this lineup and everything we talked about how it was a shorter off season than usual, which actually, uh, I'll get into in a minute with a, a question I had regarding Luca. But yeah, Phoenix is, it's not the Phoenix of the past decade or whatever it's been. Uh, this is a much better team. Obviously, we know they went 8-0 in the bubble last year. You add a Chris Paul, although he was kind of ho-hum that game for them. I think it's still a very good team. And Dallas has to, you know, they have a lot of new faces that they're working in. And you kind of got to get built into game shape and everything. And I think at that point, you you just have to kind of understand that there's going to be some early hiccups as you kind of find a flow. And I think the Clippers game was a good sign of showing, I think with Luca in particular, him kind of breaking through that a little bit because while his numbers were still pretty strong in the first couple of games, he hadn't looked quite like uh, himself, I think, as far as the bubble was concerned um, until that Clippers game. Yeah, and I think, look, th this is going to be a process. It's going to take time. There's a reason why um, Christmas Day basketball was such a snooze fest this year because, you know, it, teams are, teams and players, they're just not ready to go right now. Like, I mean, this isn't just a, a Luka problem, and, and, and it's certainly not making excuses for Luka. Um, but, you know, Mark Cuban today on, on the ticket uh, mentioned that Luka was expecting to uh, play for the national team as well to, uh, this mm -hmm. year. And that wasn't able to happen either. So, you know, these kind of things, you, it, it's, just, it's just very hard to go. Like, you have to understand, everybody has to understand that as, as unworldly as Luka Doncic is, he is still human. And, you know, there's a reason why when you and I or anybody, um, you know, sits around for a week and then tries to hop on a treadmill and we get gassed, that's what happens to human beings. Like it takes time to get back into shape. And so um, it's not that Luca's not in, in shape. He's not an NBA game playing shape, which is a whole different kind of shape to be in. Um, right. It'll take some time to get there, but he's going to get there uh, sooner rather than later. I'm confident in that. So with, uh, with it being a shorter off season and, you know, that kind of impacting the, the ramp up and everything and training camp and everything, getting into shape, we know Luca talked about how he was going to do a lot of shooting and how he was going to try and bump up really that three point shot, because I think for his career, he's like a 34% three point shooter through his first two seasons. And early on, we haven't really been able to see the, the benefits of that. I guess we haven't been able to see the improvement yet. If you, if you look through, I guess, including the preseason, he's shooting like 22, 23%. It's something like eight of 35 at that point. And if you're going off just the regular season, it's like 12 and a half percent. And, you know, like there, there's a lot, obviously, of time <laughs> to, to round into form on that front and to improve. But it is something that I don't know if it's just a little bit of that conditioning thing, as you talked about, NBA game shape, just kind of keeping your legs under you as the game 
unfolds or if it's something where maybe the condensed off season didn't allow for as much work on that front as he would have normally liked, especially if you're kind of tweaking any kind of mechanics or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, look, it, it, it's like I said, it's going to, you know, not, not just, not just running around on this floor. Like you said, Luca has a lot more things in his, in his arsenal that he's trying to, that he's trying to utilize. And, all those things are just going to take some time. It's not even just it's not even just the pure conditioning of it. It's finding your stroke. It's finding that shot. It's finding everything. Um, and remember, these guys only play, played. I think what was it like three or four games of preseason um, with a very short training camp. So it's going to take time, but but it's going to get there. Back into uh, the Luca thing there. One one thing we have noticed. You you talked about how he's working on a number of different things and all of that. He has increased, which was already really strong before, but he's increased his number of drives per game. I don't know how many drives he ended up having in that Clipper game, but I do know that obviously early on he was very aggressive attacking the basket, and I liked that Dallas was getting out in transition more, which I think opened them up to you know kind of build that lead early on. So if, if he's shooting a little bit fewer on the threes, especially while he's kind of trying to find that rhythm and get that conditioning back, and then focusing more on attacking the basket. I do think that plays to his strength because that's what that's the aspect of his game that made him so dominant in the bubble. It's like if he went to the basket, it didn't matter if Kawhi was playing and was on him. It didn't matter if it was Marcus Morris unless he was clobbering him over the head necessarily. Like that's the aspect when you're talking about a guy that finishes like 72 plus percent in the restricted area, if he can get there, like that's an element of his game that makes him so dominant and unique more so necessarily than the step back threes. Yeah. I think, I think Luca is going to have to find, you know, which way he's going to utilize his, his, his uh, scoring and what he wants, what, like, I think he, you have to be a, a complete scorer. That's, there's no doubt about that, but you know, it, it's what do you kind of fall back on? Like a good example of this is LeBron James, right? Because LeBron is not someone who is going to, who's going to rely on his shot when, th- when, when he needs to score and nothing else is going. He's going to put his head down, drive to the rim. Not to say that he can't shoot, but he relies on his driving abilities because that's who he is. That's who he is as an athlete, things like that. The opposite holds true for Steph Curry, right? Because Steph relies more on his shot. He can drive, but he, he's going to rely more on his shot than he is his driving ability. So I think Luca just has to figure out how he's going to approach this and uh, and what he wants his strength to be because I'm with you his shot is not uh it, you know it's not it, it's not great that's not to say that it can't develop mm-hmm. but it's not it's not where it is where it should be right now so do you want to just keep going bombs away every single time or do you want to actually you know uh, rely on something else that's a decision he's going to have to make and uh, you know, this is more of a one to two year thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think in I think in another year or two, everything is going to be on pretty equal grounds for him, and so uh, he'll be able to do whatever he wants at that point. Yeah, very true, very true. And you know, with him attacking the basket the way he does, it's helping break down the defense, which opens up more of those wide open looks for shooters, and that's why you're seeing in part. Uh, and, and we talked about this even before on the acquisition front alone, why you're having guys like Josh Richardson, who, yeah, it's three games. It's almost like too hilariously small of a sample size to really project it out. But just by virtue of playing alongside Luca, we figured he was going to have a career year. He's averaging career highs in points with 16.7 and 40% from three. Those are both career high marks for him. So Luca's driving and opening up things like that. It's going to find those kind of guys and it keeps that pressure on the defense more than certainly right now, more than his shooting does. Although you want to work that in every now and then to still keep them honest. Yeah, I think so. I, you know, be, if you're going to be an MVP type candidate, you're either going to have to be ridiculously dominant in one way or you're going to have to or either either you're going to have to be ridiculously dominant or you're going to have to be really good in a couple of different areas because obviously Giannis is really, you know, he's really dominant in driving. He can't really shoot that well, mm-hmm. but he's so good in driving that it that it, it doesn't matter. Um I don't think Luka is ever going to be super super dominant 
in any one way scoring the ball. So he's going to have to become uh, an all-rounded type player. Yeah, for sure. So what are your thoughts on uh, Richardson's impact early on? It seems like he's been able to impact both sides of the floor really well. Yeah, I think so. You know, he was brought in for defense and and he's done that well. I think, you know, his offense, it's been good. I still think that there's a lot left there. There's a lot of meat left on the bone. Um, I think the more that he's he's in the system, because there's two elements to this. We saw this with Christos Porzingis last year, and we're going to see it with Josh Richardson as well. There's the element of playing with Luka, and there's the element of playing in Rick Carlisle's system. Now, a lot of that is merged in one. Luka Doncic is Rick Carlisle's system, but there's still a feeling out ability. There, there's still a feeling out process um, for, for both. So I think that is going to be very important for Josh Richardson. The defense is going to come. Like the defense, as long as he continues to play that the way he has been, not just this season and in the limited games, but throughout his career, that'll be good and he'll be fine. He's going, to, he's going to benefit greatly from Christoph Porzingis coming back when he doesn't have to worry about, you know, uh, what's going on behind him because he knows that he has an elite rim protector back there. Yeah, very, very true. Speaking of uh, guys starting and all that right now, what, what is, are you surprised at all, I guess, by kind of the immediate return to full usage more or less for Dwight Powell coming back off the Achilles. He's playing about 20 minutes a game right now. He played about 26 and a half last year. So he's pretty close already to that early usage as far as minutes per game. Not surprised because of, because of two things. One, one is the obvious, no Chris House Porzingis. They need, they need all the big man minutes they can get. But the second thing is that they're not heavy duty minutes. They're not, you know, it's kind of weird. To, it's kind of complicated to to say because um, because of different things. Like you know, every NBA minute is not built the same. If you watch the games, Dwight Powell's minutes are are utilized a lot differently. He's he's utilized in small spaces in the pick and roll and things of that sort. So he's not he's not flying all over the place. Twenty six minutes of Dwight Powell or twenty minutes, sorry, of what it is this year. 20 minutes of Dwight Powell is vastly different than 20 minutes of Luka Doncic and even 20 minutes of Willie Cauley-Stein and, and especially Maxi Kleba. I think they're conserving uh, Dwight Powell to a great degree, and I think Rick Carlisle is doing a good job of that. So I wouldn't just look at the minutes alone and say he's being you know, stretched too thin because I think his, his minutes are being you know, played pretty fairly right now. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, Willie Cauley Stein and, you know, even Maxi. For, for whatever reason, Dwight Powell kind of remains, I guess, contentious among fans, polarizing, I guess, is a good word for it. Is, is there just seeing kind of what Willie Cauley Stein can do, like in the last game, uh, that one play in particular in transition where Dorian drops it off for him and he ends up dunking on Zubots? Uh, just seeing like what his athletic ceiling is and knowing that he has apparently added at least a, a respectable, although we haven't seen in the regular season yet, a respectable enough three point shot. Does, does he kind of push you think into that territory where maybe he might start to move into the starting rotation or is it just Dwight's trust he's built with Rick over the years? I think it's Dwight's trust. Like I, you know, I, it, it'll, it'll surprise me if he moves into the starting rotation um, we'll see like Rick Carlisle is very, is very loose with lineups, uh, especially early on. And um, that's what draws a lot of people frustrated with him. Like, uh, I don't know if you've seen on Twitter, I've seen quite a bit of questioning whether Rick Carlisle should be the coach and things like yeah. that. Um, you can't take what Rick Carlisle does right now on a, on a, uh, like, it's not the end game. This is not game six of the NBA finals, game seven of the NBA finals. He's feeling a lot of things out. Rick Carlisle plays the long game, and I think he's going to continue to do that with uh, giving different guys opportunities to succeed. Yeah. Do you think uh, – so even if Willie and uh, James Johnson, for instance, even if they don't move into that starting rotation necessarily, do you think that their minutes will kind of balance out, a little, I guess, a little bit with Dwight since he is slightly scaled back at 20 minutes where you might have kind of a three-year – I know, obviously, Johnson's more of a four – but uh, like a three or four headed kind of thing at that point, especially once KP's back. 
Yeah, once KP's back, the roles are going to evolve quite a bit because I think, you know, uh, I, I think it's going to revert back to a little bit of what it was last year with KP, where KP and Maxi Kleba are two in the same, like they bring the same kind of skill set to the table, whereas Willie Cauley-Stein and Dwight Powell are more of the same, where, you know, with Maxi and KP, you play more of a five-out offense. So, you know, you spread the floor. There's, a, there's an outside shooter at every position, things like that. Now, Willie Cauley-Stein is developing into a, you know, it, it looks like he's worked on his shot quite a bit, um, you know, in, in the offseason and things like that. But I still think he's going to be used more in the pick and roll and inside game than he is going to be uh, with anything else. So I think that's going to be important to kind of consider of like, you know, what the different roles, what they're looking for from, from, these, uh, from these players because you don't need Willie Cauley-Stein to play five-out offense if you have Christos Porzingis and Maxi Kleba. You don't need to be three deep in that role. Um, you can just use him for what he does best. So right now, whatever Willie Cauley-Stein is doing, is all, it, it, it's all gravy. Uh, remember, though, this team is built around Luka and KP, and once KP comes back, what, like, you know, I, like, I think at that point, I'd be happy to hop back on the podcast and talk about like, you know, sure. how different everything is going to look because people forget Luka Doncic is the conductor of this team, but this team doesn't work without KP. It just, it just doesn't. He's a, he, he's, if not, if he's not a superstar, he's a borderline superstar. And, uh, and there's a reason for that. Yeah, for sure. So after the Christmas day game, Carlisle referencing KP's timetable, uh, use the term weeks, not months, as far as how far away he is. Uh, we've seen a little bit of video with KP and five on five, very little contact and all that, if any. But is, is that somewhat, su- I guess, surprising to you at all that even though we are seeing these kind of glimpses of it, that I guess it feels open ended when you say weeks, not months, because you're like, all right, so months is in plural. Does that mean five weeks or fewer? And does that still feel really far out compared to what we were thinking and hoping necessarily? Well, you know, there's an update from that literally today, uh, you know, on, on Tuesday where, where Carlisle said Christoph Porzingis was a full go in practice today. So he was a full Excellent. participant in practice. And, uh, and, you know, Rick Carlisle added on to that saying that sometime in the next two weeks isn't too far-fetched. So I think, you know, you're really narrowing that timetable down now to where if Christoph Porzingis is not back by – mid to late January, I'm talking January 15th through the 21st, Mm -hmm. sometime in there. I think, I think at that point, eyebrows will be raised because when, when you say that someone two weeks being back is not too far fetched. Well, three weeks is, is as much of a cushion as you can give on that timetable at that point. So um, I think that's going to be a development that's going to be worth watching. Okay. That's, that's good to know. Um, obviously, this team, they're going to have to manage him carefully. And as you said earlier, I think they're going to be very conservative in how they use that. There are more back-to-backs, if I'm not mistaken, this year, just because it's a little bit condensed. And so I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if they scale back like they did more so in the first half of last year, where one of the two games in the back-to-back or whatever, they just they don't play him that game. They take the extra cautious route just to try and manage him a little bit because the knee soreness he had uh, and he came back in January right before the shutdown initially. And he was, he missed what 10 games, I think with like soreness in that right knee. And that's the one he ended up having the meniscus tear. Although I think that's just coincidental. So I think they'll probably have to manage him extra cautiously now, given he's only on year two of that five year deal. Yeah. I, this is going to be a really big talking point once not, not, not necessarily among the team, but at least for me, this is really interesting Um, because when you talk about the KP management, what's the scale here? Like, is it, is it, is it something where, you know, is it something where you have to manage his minutes in the game? Is it where you have to manage, manage his games in a season um, what is the right management? So, you know, what I'm trying to say is say it's a 72 game season. He doesn't play any back to backs. Is that the answer? Now can mm-hmm. he play 35 minutes a game and there's no worries or even though he doesn't play back to backs, do you still have to really manage his game time 
And if and, and now if you're managing how many minutes he plays, it, it goes even more micro on top of that, right? Because it's not just minutes in a game. Now you're talking what are the spurts of those minutes? Does he yeah. play six minutes at a time? Does he play for a full quarter at a time? There's a lot of aspects to this KP management that's going to be really interesting and that's going to be really defining of what the Mavericks are going to be able to do over the next four years. Well, even going more complicated than that, KP talking about the meniscus tear said it was a, a contact injury. And obviously the ACL uh, when that happened was as well. So when you're not even talking about a wear and tear issue, that makes it even more difficult to nail down because at that point you're just kind of managing probability, right? Like just the amount of time he's out there. Uh, you know, if you're reducing that, you're reducing the chance of it happening. But if it's not a, a wear and tear type thing where it's just like, okay, we've been running them too hard, too long. And so now he's having, you know, these issues crop up. It, it gets, I think, more complicated there where it really does become like a, a, as much data as they have. They, it's not like they're just guessing and hoping for the hoping for the best, you know, but it is still a little bit of just there's an unknown factor there that I think complicates it even further than, you know, than you would probably like. But Oh, absolutely. And, and the big thing here is that this is, there, there, there isn't a lot to go on from the past. A lot of people um, like to, you know, make the comparison to Dirk, which, which like, I, and I don't mean this in an offensive way, but I think it's a lazy comparison because Dirk, even in his younger years, and, you know, I, I've been watching Dirk my whole life, um, he was not doing the things with the ball, handle, handling the ball and things like that um, to quite the extent that KP was. Now, Dirk was driving, he was dunking, he was doing all that kind of stuff. KP is the world's biggest point guard. That's not what Dirk ever was. Dirk was at best, uh, you know, he was, he was a power forward who looked like a, looked like a small forward shooting guard type thing at times. KP can literally play, the, play basketball like a point guard. And I don't know if that body frame, if a 7374 body frame is built humanly like I don't know if we as humans are built to do the things that he he does so th this is completely unprecedented and there's not a lot to go off of but you're absolutely right the Mavs are not just sticking darts on the wall that they are very calculated in how they're doing this with their medical staff and things like that um, the Mavericks are lucky they have one of the best medical staffs in the country um, so that's a good thing but this is going to be a lot of feeling out and a lot of, you know, trying to make sure that they're, that they're, they're handling everything correctly. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, real quick, last question here, how much stock I, again, it's three games. It's an incredibly small sample size, like pretty much the smallest sample size you could realistically try and find any trend from, but how much stock do you put in the kind of early season here? Cause obviously the truth has to lie somewhere between the frustration of Christmas day and how the team, you know, kind of failed to execute, whether it was rebounding or what have you. And uh, the 51 point historic beatdown of the Clippers the other day. What, uh, what do you, I guess, take away from what we've seen early on? Um, you know, this is going to sound like a cop-out answer, but, but quite literally nothing. And the reason why is not because either one, it's not because I don't believe in any of those results like, I do believe that the Suns outplayed the Mavericks. I wholeheartedly believe that the Lakers are a better team than the Mavericks. Mm -hmm. And I actually do believe that the Mavericks are a better team than the Clippers. I don't think they're 51 points a night better. But mm -hmm. I do think that, like, I do think that if you asked me before the season, I would pick the Mavericks to finish on top of the Clippers in the standings. Yes, I know Kawhi Leonard didn't play that game. Very well aware of that. Even with Kawhi. I would pick the Mavericks to finish ahead of the Mavericks or ahead of the Clippers in the standings. I think a realistic expectation, um, and we'll have a better idea of this in the next three weeks when more games are played and KP returns. Um, I think a real realistic expectation for the Mavericks is somewhere between the three to five seed. I would pencil them in as a four seed. Like they're probably the fourth best team in the Western conference. Um, and depending on how, how the chips fall, they could finish as the third best team as well. But I think the Lakers are locked up on the top of the conference and then we'll see what happens in two, three, four, but the Mavericks are up there. Um, you know, it, 
the the best comparison I can make, and I don't know how much your listeners will you know uh, relate to this, but I grew up watching the New England Patriots every single game. Um, the Patriots in September always were two and two, one and three, something like that. They were always figuring things out in September, and one of the things Tom Brady always said was Bill Belichick always said that real football doesn't start until Halloween. Um, that is, that is a, that is a format. That is something that I would adopt here with the Mavericks because of how Rick Carlisle is. He's going to try out a lot of different things in this first month or two. Um, this is all about getting to the playoffs and then seeing where it goes from there. So, you know, just, you know, everyone has to chill out for about another month and kind of see where this thing goes, allow Luca to get back into playing shape. KP is going to come back. He's not going to be in NBA playing shape right away. Rick Carlisle is going to juggle lineups. Willie Cauley-Stein, Dwight Powell, they'll have more minutes on alternate nights, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Um, come February, we can talk about what, what this team's playoff destiny is going to be. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a good point. Especially, uh, you know, in the West, we, we've talked about this before, the, the distance between two and seven was closer than it was between seven and eight. So the West is already a jumbled mess. And the Mavericks, I do feel, got better. Obviously, defensively, I think they'll be leagues better than last year. And, you know, the offense, as long as you got Luka, they were third most, they were the third highest scoring offense in the league last year. We know about the efficiency in those historic proportions. But I, I think as long as you got Luka, and you improved on the defense, you're going to be better. But then you see what, how Richardson's able to fit in. And if you can then bank on any kind of consistency as far as the health of Luka and KP, then yeah, this team's ceiling is very, very high. I could certainly see that three, four seed like you were talking about. So it'll be fun, but we got a, we got a ways to go. We're only three games in. We got a lot, a lot of basketball ahead of us with all the ups and downs that entails. So Thanks for uh, jumping on here again with me, Saad. Always a pleasure to talk Ma Mavericks basketball with you. Uh, like I said, anytime you want to jump on or talk, uh, by all means, you have the open platform, sir. Absolutely, man. I really appreciate it. Always, always enjoy talking with you. Um, and, and I think you do a really good job on this. So I uh, hope all your listeners really appreciate your work. Oh, thank you very much. But yeah, we'll, uh, we'll schedule some time as well to get you on. I still want to do that uh, kind of profile piece on you a little bit as well. Just kind of talk about your background and all that. Um, I still want to set that up sometime, but we'll, we'll figure that out. But, yeah, absolutely. I would love to do that. Okay, cool. Well, guys, don't forget to drop a like, leave a comment below, subscribe, check out Saad's work with The Athletic and the Dallas Stars beat. And until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace. Thank <laughs> you.